Hey investors, Bradley here from Watson Estates. Thank you for joining us. We are number one on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts for Toronto real estate. Make sure you leave us a like, a subscribe. We're gonna to continue to put out fantastic content. And today I'm gonna to share with you a video, in fact, a podcast that we did with my friend Gary Hibbert over from Real Home Choice. He runs a podcast called Real Talk with Gary and I was fortunate enough to be a guest on that show. So I'm gonna share that with you today. I hope you enjoy. Get into that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your story and, and, and why you got into becoming a realtor uh, and also get into real estate investing. Awesome. So, well, my story, I was, I went through university. I took business. Originally my plan through school was to become an accountant. Funny enough, yep. glad I didn't go that way. And I ended up uh, recycling what I had learned and gone through finance. So I was planning to do a big move in banking, ended up landing through insurance and all the while hated my job and thought, you know what? I want to keep learning. I love learning despite school. <laughs> all right. Okay. And so I went, took real estate courses, but all the while outside of real estate, I was learning about investing and this idea of building multifamilies. And I remember a guy named Jay Morrison. I don't know if you've seen him. It was, I don't even know if he's putting out a lot of content now, but he was one of the guys that first inspired me to get into multi-unit homes. If you're going to buy a property, why not rent out yeah. a big portion of that? So that's what I did. I was a realtor before an investor. So I was, I like to call myself the homeless realtor. And then eventually okay. I got myself a property and nice. because of cash flow, we were living for under 500 bucks a month. And from there we got the equity gains we see, we've only seen in the GTA and been able to take that and bought a few other rental units. And since then I've had, we've, we're in, and like you've kind of mentioned at the beginning, kind of in a semi-retirement because my wife is not working by choice. She, she, we're talking about when she wants to go back to work. I have two young daughters. The most recent is less than a month old and we're just enjoying life together. And yes, I sell real estate, but it's been investing in real estate that I've been able to build a portfolio that you can't get from a nine to five and you can't get from a sales job. So it's been wonderful. That's amazing. Okay. So listen, uh, if I'm brand new and I'm listening to this podcast, I really want to know how were you able to get to the position that you're at? So I'm going to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that because I think it's important. And then also we're going to get into some predictions and, and trends and where we see that Toronto real estate market going, right? I want to keep people uh, in, engaged in this call. So how were you able to purchase that first investment property? So you said you got your realtor license first, right? I did have my real estate license. So, so there's a bit of commission in there, which was, which was kind of nice to have, but the, the philosophy is unchanging. I mean, some of my largest investors, they're not realtors. They don't want the headache of dealing with selling. So as an right. investor, the idea here is cash flow, And this is often a challenge in Toronto. And we were talking about this on, on my podcast just this past week. Yep. And so you have to be creative, right? Like you have to look for where am I going to get the best source of cash? Now there are investors that have lots of money that they don't care if they get a monthly cash flow because at the end of the mm -hmm. year, they've made a mortgage pay down and they're still ahead. But if you're starting out, cash flow is often a big deciding factor because the house needs to carry itself. And if you're going to live there all the more because you're getting primary residence exemptions, which is a saving of your taxes when you go to sell the property. So, so learning the game, learning how, what are the tax implications? What are the way you structure it? Do you open a corporation? Do you do it personally? And different properties I've done, I've done in different ways. And so whether I can summarize it in five minutes is pretty much impossible. And like you said on my show, I would agree. Right. It's surrounding people around you that know what to do, asking questions, find someone who has 10 plus units and say, how have you structured your units? And also yeah. try and decide what kind of units do you want? Do you want a portfolio? Some people don't want that many, right? Some people only want two, three, and they're happy. In fact, if you look at the stats, the majority of people have less than two, three units of investors across the city. Like that's, there's, it's very unusual to have double digit investment properties, but if you want that, there's a different method of, of structuring it. So I've had units where I've gone in in, in less than a year and we've made over a hundred thousand uh, after tax dollars on those units actually out in Oshawa. We were talking about that as well out that mm -hmm. way. I've also made units where I bought them and I'm sitting back thinking, should I just sell it? Like, cause I immediately make a profit. And some of this comes from the quick equity gains, but ultimately the way you generate multi-generational wealth in real estate is a long buy and hold strategy. And that's been what's working for me. So. Yeah, no, I can't agree with that more. Yes. It's that buy and hold and, and you get that hockey 
stick curve, right? And so it doesn't do a whole lot in the beginning, but you just never know when it's going to take off. That's, that's number Got one. It. Yeah. Number two, you're right. Surrounding yourself with the right people, the right team. That is incredibly important. But how did you get your first investment property? Like, you know, well, okay. you, especially being self-employed, that's not easy. So, okay, there you go. So here's the strategy. Here's my, here was my strategy. Okay. I had a job I hated, but I also was a part-time realtor. This is where I was at. In fact, my mm. property was the first one I sold. First purchase I made It's very hard to sell something that you don't, you're not invested in yourself. So the first right. property that I purchased was mine. The first property I sold was my mom's. <laughs> okay. So as okay. on the sales side. Now, when we bought it, we, so I was fortunate enough through university, I had paid off my school. So step one, get rid of the debt. I had no debt to my name. In fact, I just got married the same year. I got married, I bought my house and I quit my job shortly within a month after purchasing the property because we were confident in what we had. Now, Sandra, my wife, she was fortunate enough to get a scholarship through university that paid for her schooling. And she also being frugal had saved $40,000. That's what we had to our name, that was our wealth. So that amount of money we had to invest in a down payment, which would seem like nothing today. Uh, back right. then it was, it was enough. It wasn't 20%. That was for the home that you're living in today or oh, well, no. well, whatever it was. Yeah, that was my first then. place. Yeah, that was my first place. Okay, got it. Yep. Now okay. we, we also knew, and part of the reason I was comfortable quitting, our monthly expenses were going to be low because we mm -hmm. opted to live in the basement. So we lived in a one bedroom basement unit and rented to a family above us who had three units up top. So we rented theirs for 17, 1800 and we were paying at the end of the month less than 500 bucks. So obviously banking money, obviously getting capital appreciation on the back of someone else. Thank you very much. And then you cycle it through. You buy, you buy another one and, and repeat, right. and repeat. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing that you just touched on as well too, that it's, it's not about buying that dream home in the beginning. And I think a lot of people just get caught up in that by going out and, and, and getting the most that they possibly can. You did it smart. So you actually said, look, you know what, this is not going to be our dream home, but this is our first step into real estate investing. We're not going to take the top floor. We're going to live in this little basement, manage our expenses. And then, and, and so then what did you start doing now to learn about real estate investing? Did you start going to real estate investment classes where you weren't learning online or you just started surrounding yourself with, with, with top All people? of it, all of it. Most yeah. of it was online, right? Like you don't, you don't need to spend a lot of money to learn. You got to put in the time. You either put in the time or you put in the money, right? The money buys you time. So as you, get, right. as you, go, up the, as you go up the ladder, obviously my time is worth more now with a family and the career I have than the money. So I'll pay for it. When you first get started though, there's a wealth of information out there that's accessible to everybody. So even listening to a podcast like this, you have listeners getting a tremendous value and how much did they spend to listen today? Nothing. And there's lots yeah, in here. Yeah, exactly. So. Right. Okay. So then now for your next property, the third property, the fourth property, are you doing these on your own or are you getting joint venture partners to jump in with you? I have, I have had a lot of requests. For, for joint venture partnerships. And I haven't taken any of those deals I've done. And the reason is a selfish one. It's because I like the idea of knowing and controlling what's going on in my investment. I also know a lot of people are trying, they try and take advantage once you're in a position of knowing what you're doing. So as much as pop pooling money, if I have conversations with people, like for example, I've got a brother right now who just recently graduated high school and I told him save money up, get, 30, 40 grand. And then I I'm matching every dollar he's putting aside. And then I told him and I'll partner with you. So you have opportunities that come. There's different ways. Like you were talking about private lending is another option. There's ways to invest. You can do REITs, right? You, if you want to invest yep. in something a little faster. Um, so for me, it's been, I'm a slow, I'm slow actually. Like I'm not looking to pool like, and we've, I mean, I know you have too. We've interviewed people that have dozens and dozens of properties and they do great, but you don't need that. You really don't. As long right. as you're, as long as you're, if you've got two properties, you're outpacing the market because the market is in one yep. fold and you're in two fold. Everything above that is gravy. And then it comes down to managing. Like I've had units that have been further away and I just can't, I can't have the headache. It's not worth it. I could be making money and I just don't, I don't want that lifestyle. So that's been the way we've decided it. Obviously we chase where there's opportunities for cash flow is, is a, is a big deciding factor, at least for me, but because of the, the, the width of the GTA and how wide the growth has been, we've still reaped tremendous rewards in equity. And now I live in my dream home. Right. 
right? Which is amazing. And so then let me talk about the second property. Now, are, and were you looking for properties that were distressed? Because obviously you didn't have a ton of money at that time, right? So, so how did you do that? And also was it in Toronto? So funny enough, we did have a lot, quite a bit of money. We were in a really good position by the time I hit the second property. And I think to thank for that is the market. And, and the, mm. the bigger question I had at that point is, do I incorporate or not? And that was a decision that, was, that ultimately I had to decide how many of these do I want? If I want 10 or more down the road, right. then I'm going to want to incorporate. And so we chose to incorporate. And that was, a, that, was part of, that was part of that process. And so we were able to take the equity, obviously refinance it. There's, you can only take up to 20% has to stay in the property. So we did that. And it's, it's a very, it's a very easy and common method of taking what you've got and, and putting it somewhere else. What we've done actually in order to buy this property is I've actually downsized some of my investments, which kills me, but I've made that decision because my wife is off and I, I want the cash. I want the, and it's also a peace of mind. Like I would, I would be completely comfortable with a tenant in my basement but my wife is not. So, right. so guess what? We've got a tenant or not? No. <laughs> right. We got, I got two right. kids and a wife in my own property. Now, could I be stretching myself to this point? I'm a guy and I'm, I'm actually not even 30 yet. So absolutely. I could be, I could be doing that, but, but life matters more than money to some extent. You have to choose how you want to play it, but there's, there's, there's a million ways to become a millionaire. Yeah. You know what? And that's such a really good point. It really is. It's just more than just about the money, it's about the lifestyle as well too. And I, and I, and I actually just shot a, a quick video because I'm actually out here again at the cottage and uh, this, this incredible quote that really helped change my life in the beginning. At first, it didn't really resonate with me. And so I don't know if you know Jim Rohn, yes. but he, he had this quote and he goes, make the goal to become a millionaire, not for the money, but for the person that you will become to achieve it. And at first it was like, oh, okay. But then once you start to get the money, then you realize that it's not so much about the money. It's the person you have to become, the hard work, the consistency, um, and, and everything else that comes along with it. And that is what really kind of creates that lifestyle. Because then whether the market goes up or down, or you go through hard times or good times, you can always weather that storm, right? And I think that's what it's really all about. Yeah, that you realize really quickly once you have money, it's not all about money. And in the same caliber, whether you take money away from someone that's capable of creating a million dollars, that same person will find it again. Once, once, you've got, once you've got the mindset and the effort, like the podcasting that we're doing, this is not an easy venture. I mean, I've been on this adventure for 90 days now. We're doing one pretty much every day. To, today we're recording, it's the 30th of June. Tomorrow's Canada Day. And Sandra's like, are you taking tomorrow off? I'm like, why would I take a day off? <laughs> Cause it's Canada day. <laughs> Is that not more of a reason where people are going to want to celebrate? Right. Right. So, yeah. So there's no, you don't sleep on success and, but ultimately you can choose what you want to do. The, the freedom, the freedom right. to decide whether my wife stays again, not 30 yet. And I have the ability to live in my dream home and have my wife take care of my kids, which is the best childcare, especially when childcare centers are closed. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and exactly. be able to choose that's, that's, that is freedom it really is. Right. And you know what it is. And I bet you probably might even have forgotten that tomorrow was Canada day because when you're living your passion, you know, sometimes like what we got a holiday on Monday or we got a holiday on this day. Like you just, you actually do forget. But I remember when I was in that corporate world, I was like literally looking forward to that holiday, like months in advance. I'm like, I can't wait until July 1st would hit, you know? And so yeah. it really does change your perspective on life and that, you know, Monday is, can be just as exciting as a Saturday. Absolutely. Right? It's, 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 it's what you make it. Now, let's kind of get back into the market that you're in. You, and you're most of your investing is in Toronto. Is that correct? Yeah. Or Toronto investing? is the market I studied most. Super intensely. Intense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's talk about the residential side of okay. what you're doing in Toronto and, and maybe specifically kind of where in Toronto you're investing and, it, and if it's even viable to continue to keep investing in Toronto but based on the prices that you're seeing. So, so it depends on, it's funny because trends happen, I'd say every five years you get a major shift in the culture. So if you look right. back in 2015, 2016, it was the game was in low rise. It was in low rise housing, you know, townhome, semi detached. You want your little piece of the land. That was the game. 
as 2017 came around, everyone was saying, oh, well, you young people, like look for affordability, buy yourselves a condo, get something more affordable, you know? And, and they're like, I don't, want a, I don't want a condo. Like who wants a condo? I don't want to squeeze myself in this little hole in the sky, you know? And that was the attitude. Now all of a sudden prices become outrageous and people say, you know what? A condo is looking pretty good right about now. You know, I can see the water from my bedroom. I like that. So during those times, I say condos right. really made a number as it relates to equity. Like they saw tremendous equity growth up until recently. And so here comes right. your new five-year cycle. We now have a bit of an exodus happening where people are looking for a backyard. They're looking for a pool. And so to, to say, where are you investing? My, where I was investing five years ago is completely different than what I'm looking at today. Now I would say, are there specific pockets that outperform others? Yes, but generally you can take a very general outlook on it. I'd say some of the larger condos are doing really well. The small stuff, they're not doing very well. They kind of got caught. I actually feel really bad for young people who jumped in that are kind of caught. They're struggling as it relates to, to collecting rental income as well, if you are using it as an investment property. So today I would say in the short term, your best investment is as an investor, I would say wherever you can get cash flow, which is outside the city. You can't, as a right. local investor, you can't find it inside. Now, if you put 50% down, some of my oh, like foreign investors, they are, they're comfortable with being downtown because they don't care. Like they've got the money. They're comfortable with being in the area that yes, fluctuates more, but will also increase in value quicker and, come and bounce back higher. So the closer you are to the city, generally, the better off you'll be long-term, but in the short term, absolutely, I'm seeing a trend away from something small and more so to urban living, office space type properties. Okay, so you're saying, this, and you touch on a lot of different things there that are great. So in the beginning, were you doing more investing in condos? Or was it? I, I actually like personally have stayed away from condos throughout the whole journey. I, I don't get oh, into did. condos. Okay. That's me. There's a lot. I think condos have a better place in something like a pre-construction or if you need to live downtown. I never worked downtown. If I was looking no. for that lifestyle, that would be a lifestyle choice that you pay for in maintenance fees. And you pay for right. it. Let's say you're, you're a senior and you want to retire and travel and you want someone to have security for your place. Then it makes sense. For my lifestyle, a condo has never made sense. So I never really bought into the, I'm going to buy a quick condo, but there's a lot of people okay. have made more money than I have because they did invest in a condo at the right time. Right. Yeah. And again, that's, you know, and the thing too, is like, when you look back at it, high sense, so it's 2020, but you never know when and how you can time the market, right? It's, it's, it's always more like time in the market, mm -hmm. but let's talk about the condo prices. So are you seeing the condo prices going down is that so, what you're kind yes of seeing right now? No. In yes and okay. no. So, so yes, in the fact that if we compare from March, mid-March, which is when COVID, yeah. I think it was the 17th, was the official closing of Ontario. In the market yeah. from that time, the prices of condos dropped 10.5%. So yes. However, oh, wow. the numbers even in the last month, and the numbers came out last month in May, and what I anticipate you'll see this month is that they're actually up in condos. And not only are they up, they're up higher than detached. The condos last month were up 6% year over year. So it's important if we're tracking month to month or year to year. That's why I found such success in our podcast because things change not just monthly or weekly. Now they change daily. We've got, we've got mm -hmm. reports that come out on a weekly basis tracking what's going on with rents, what's going on with, with pricing and the, the months of inventory, right? The balance between supply and demand. What an interesting story. Like it's so interesting. So, so, so condos condo. here are up, uh, but month over month are down. The question is, is will we get back to where we were in March? Okay. So year over year, which is what I like to pay attention to. So we're actually up we six up. and is it no. six and a half percent. Interesting. Percent. Not only are we up, but we were up in May. And the reason that that matters is May historically is your spring market. That's your highest price point month as it was in 2019, but right. we're in 2020. We don't have a spring and the spring, if we do have it is now it's in June and July. So funny right. enough that we were able to maintain. So what happened really in the condo side is you had such a fast price appreciation, double digits, several double digits, all of us, all of a sudden get hit extra hard because they were roaring, but because they were doing so well last year, you still see those numbers reflected in higher year over year pricing. Okay. So you said that you're also seeing an exodus of people potentially leaving or they are leaving condos. Is that more the renters? And is that where some of these investors are going to get hit because the rent prices have come down now? 
here's the flow. Let me tell you, this is the movement. People who are local, okay. they move out. Yep. Guys like us who have been in, in the country for a while, we're moving outwards. So we're moving to places that are more affordable. It's very difficult to move inwards. It, I mean, as a trend, the people who are buying locally are foreign investors. People who have more money are coming to our country. People who are immigrating that are coming with money in their pocket. Yes, they wait a few years and they're renting in the time being, but these are the buyers. So one of the big things that I'm tracking right now is immigration. And the mm -hmm. reason condos have been hard hit, especially is because immigrants, people who move in their money outside overseas, which has been decreasing since 2017, by the way. But as that money has slowed down, that has hardest hit luxury real estate and small condos. And so that's why you're seeing them mm -hmm. getting especially beat up. So are there more people leaving the city? Not necessarily. What the problem okay. is, is there's not people replacing the ones who are. Okay, got it. So it's so the luxury condos and the smaller footprint type condos are the ones that are actually getting hit the hardest. Yeah. Got it. And yeah. then you're also seeing now some investors that have bought condos where the rents were maybe just borderline or maybe a little bit of negative cash flow, where they're now potentially getting more negative cash flow because they don't have that pool, right? Of, I, of I was making videos. I've been doing videos. The podcasting thing has been recent, but I've been doing videos for three, four years now. Even yeah. two years ago, I did a video. You can go back and find it. I don't look so fresh and I'm walking around actually downtown. In, and, yeah. I, and in that video, I say, there's no more cash flow in Toronto. This is two years ago. So if you're right. looking for a cash flow property, get outside the city. Don't, don't spend your time downtown. If you, want, if you want equity growth, which is the big money, by the way, equity growth long term, right. that's the big money. You got to be downtown. So it depends on your investment style and your strategy. I like that, that, that you really hit on a really good point there. And that's more for the deep pocket type of a clients, right? Where they can say, Hey, look, you know what? I'm not too worried about the cash flow. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. Uh, let, let me, I, I know that Toronto is a very strong market and I know that uh, it's going to continue to go up, even if you might have some ups and downs, but overall, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, I'm going to put my money in the downtown market. If I'm brand new moving into the market, you're pretty much saying, yeah, you may want to stay away from that Toronto or the downtown area, kind of maybe move a little bit to the outskirts. Yeah. And it's so difficult to, to do broad strokes because some people work downtown, right? And, and they will still right. be going in or, or even if you don't work downtown, there's still a lifestyle that comes downtown, especially if you're young or maybe you've been dealing with your parents with COVID for the last, you know, six months and you're saying to hell with them, I want, I want my own little spot. So and, and depending on what you get, like maybe we're not buying something large, maybe we're buying. So, if, so I guess the summary is if you live there, buy where you want to live. However, if you're buying for an investment as a first, an early on investment investor, I would be looking more for cash flow. I wouldn't be chasing, I wouldn't be chasing equity as the, as the main event, because especially for the next year or two, there's no guarantees of equity growth. There's a lot of question marks on whether it'll go up or down and in what markets. And yet that you're seeing anything else that, that's as important for, for, for my listeners to kind of understand. So yeah, that's, that's a good blanket question. Cause that leaves that here it comes guys. Buckle your seat. All right, let's do it. Is, <laughs> is, this, is this a crystal ball part this of the is, conversation? This is my crystal ball. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, so, I love crystal so balls. for depending on when you get this. So again, we're recording the end of June. I expect you're going to see the numbers when they come out in, in the next week or so. The numbers in June are going to be really good. They're going to be really high across. Yeah. In fact, we've already seen detached across the city are incredible. What I think you're going to start to see between now and when listeners are maybe tuning in is a conversation about months of inventory. Months of inventory is going to start coming down. In fact, it's already coming down in some cities across the GTA. The, the areas that have the fastest drop in months of inventory are the areas that are going to outperform through the rest of 2020. The areas that I'm watching and my clients are most interested in right now is the mortgage deferrals, which is happening August and September, combined with CERB, which is coming due unless it gets extended again around July, August. So those two things are leaving a big fat question mark and it has a lot of people freaking out. Now, the banks have set themselves up to weather that storm. So the banks are good. The banks are not a problem. The question is, can the average Canadian continue to carry their mortgage? And the question I don't hear anyone else asking is, can they extend it? Is it possible? And that hasn't even been a conversation yet, but if in fact it's needed, I have confidence that the government is already thrown this much money. It's only a matter of time to see what, how they support the, the local investments nearby. Now, for people who are selling, 
because we're in a spring market today, I would say this is a good time. If you're trying to get rid of that place in the next year, this is a good place to open up some cash and get rid of what you got. However, if you want to buy something, you've already missed the dip. The dip is behind us, at least the most recent dip. So I would say purchase something with long term in mind, which brings me back to this idea of cash flow, right? Like come at it smart, come at it knowing I'm going to be here for a few years. And the resiliency of the market is we're talking six plus percent on average across the GTA over the last 50 years. So there's, there's a ton of money. Yeah. Right. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what will happen when that money does stop coming in from the government and what they're going to do. Because I, I guess if somebody's sitting on a lot of equity, they may be okay. Even if they can't go to the bank and maybe they're self-employed, they may then, and this will be interesting to see if the private market opens up where for second mortgages, where somebody says, Hey, look, you know what? I love my home so much. I don't want to leave, you know, um, lend me a hundred or 150,000. Well, what, what are your thoughts on that? And, well, and if, we look, if we look, I, I've talked to uh, bankruptcy trustees and lawyers and like, the, if you look at the actual lending amounts, the lending, the borrowing amounts are going up. And the reason is because the deferrals is tacking on to the end. That's sign one. The number of bankruptcies are actually down. The numbers have gone down. And the reason is because they're getting free money. They're getting the government handout. So your question is the most valid question, which is what happens when the free money stops? And when does the free money stop? And does COVID happen again? In which case, if we do see closures, I mean, we had a slight uptick down in near uh, Essex. We've seen a little bit of, of an uptick in COVID. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see because every other week we're tracking to see, do we reopen another stage? And if for whatever reason we cycle backwards and we go back down to stage one or stage two, wherever we are, that is going to pose a significant problem because I think the reason that our market gets hit the hardest, like we saw in 2017, is psychology. Are people confident in our market? Right now, yes, very confident. And sellers know what they got. Supply is very tight. If that confidence were to be interfered, real or artificially, you're going to see a lot more concern and you'll see maybe the 60, 70% pullback in sales that we saw just a couple months ago. Do you think they're going to shut us down again? No. Really? No, I don't okay. Think so. I, didn't I don't think we're going that? backwards. So you think we're, no? no, I don't think so. Okay. Even like when you see like what's happening kind of like down in the U S there and, uh, and they're really kind of pushing for potentially that second shutdown. You don't think it's going to happen in Canada? I don't think so. Will we see a second wave potentially, but we are, we're ready for it now. You know, right. I mean, they're even just today there's, they're passing in the city of Toronto that you're going to need to wear masks. So, so as that happens, we have a bit, businesses have now been reconfigured. The numbers, if we look at unemployment, they happened the hardest in April. May is actually, the GDP is back up again. So as right. we start to recover and at least get our bearings. Now, that's not to say airlines and travels and all of these places aren't still hard hit. Absolutely. But I think the guys that got hit already got hit. Is there going to be a second hit? Maybe. But I don't think it's going to come in the way of slowing. It'll, it'll be more of a slowdown in reopenings than I think going backwards. That's, is that going to happen? I don't know. That's just my thinking. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So I haven't heard that yet. So Toronto actually came out and said that now it's what mandatory to wear it's masks? Today, or, it hasn't passed it... yet. Yeah, oh, everywhere, really? the cities. Not only that, all the mayors across the GTA all have come together to appeal to the province to make it mandatory across the province because as we see, it can pop up in any one area. So I'm doing my job, are you doing your job? And my understanding is the province said no, but the cities are still taking the precautions to go ahead with what they were standing by. All the big cities mm -hmm. across the GTA. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I know now that the patios are open, well, in, in certain cities and, uh, and if you, if you do go to the patio, yeah, your, your, your waiter or your waitress, they, they do have to wear the mask and a lot of businesses that they're wearing masks as well too, but you're seeing a lot of people, you're still seeing a lot of people not wearing the masks and you're seeing some people wear the mask. So, be so, so it will be mandatory. How you enforce that? God, if I know, Right. Like, right. can you, like, I don't know. I, like we've seen other places, like I think New York might've done that. And like, they say you need to wear masks, but what are you going to do? Arrest the, especially when you've got so much pressure right now on policing, right? Like, are you going to yeah. actually arrest that person right now? Are you, do you want that in the news? So I don't know, but these are, these are all just symbols to me that we have our handle on it. Not perfectly, but we know what we're dealing with. Not only do we know what we're dealing with, we've dealt with this now for a couple months. So this is a new reality. 
if we get another uptick in cases, that could introduce something new that could become like if, if COVID makes a new thing, but we don't even really know, this is going outside real estate, but we don't really know what a second wave would really look like. Like, will yeah. that happen in the fall? Would that happen in the spring? And, and is COVID itself something that we're gonna have to live with? Like, is this something that is ongoing for, in our future moving forward? Or is this something that we will get a vaccine for and we will solve? And, and to know yeah. all those things, I mean, that's a crystal ball outside of real estate. <laughs> right. And, and, listen, and, and even though I know we're, we're just a little bit on the outside of the real estate piece, I still think it's important because that ties into real estate. And especially what you're talking about earlier, just in regards to the psychology, the confidence of people. And if people start to feel a little nervous or there's that wave of nervous going through, that, that can change the, the price of real estate. It does. Right. And I think we've gotten hit by that shock because if you look, even during stage one, even when right all the way shut down, real estate continued to happen. We noticed a huge mm -hmm. uptick in showings the moment the reopening, the first one happened. Because if yeah. you think about all the things you could be doing right now, going and looking in a property that has an agent that's touching everything for you, completely sanitized, wearing a mask, yeah. all by yourself with this person, that is one of the least risky things you could be doing right now. If anything, if you're bored and scared of going to a patio, maybe you want to look at houses, right? Yeah, no, for so We've sure. seen confidence. Will that change? Maybe, but even if it does, the train has left the station. Prices are increasing very quickly. So it'll have to be something quite powerful to slow it down. Right. And you're seeing multiple offers that are happening in the city, right? I mean, yeah, we're, we're seeing over. it out here in Durham. Yeah. We're I seeing saw an article Durham, the other day where it was an agent saying this. They're like, oh yeah, you know what I've noticed? There's five, there's five offers and two, two or three of them, they now have conditions in them. That's kind of weird. But the joke is, is do you think those are the ones winning the multiple offers? No, they're just stimulating the other two that don't have those conditions. And even though you have 10 or five multiple offers, the fact that you have people pricing them for multiple offers and the fact you have months of inventory now coming down, like these are, these are leading indicators. Like a, a quickly dropping months of inventory should tell you our bigger problem locally here in Toronto is not, the bigger problem is not whether home prices are gonna go up or down. The bigger problem is actually affordability. It's whether we're going to even have the supply on the end of all of this to address the housing issues and with pre-construction slowing down, right? And even despite immigration, we are still number one in Canada and the United States for new people applying to move to our country. We, we top the list. So, right. yeah. Yeah. And now I haven't paid attention to the immigration piece. I mean, I know our borders are obviously locked down. Are, are, have they kind of come up with the date in regards to when they're going to open that up how, how close are you paying attention so, to the immigration because that's obviously an important piece to, to to the gta so our borders are open to new immigrants right now that's a, that's actually an approach that canada's taken that's different than the states the states are saying you're not allowed mm. coming in canada if you want to become a permanent resident, you're you're allowed to apply to be a permanent resident still in our country now applications are down i've seen as much as 80 percent year over year so a huge drop off off the cliff, which I mean, that matters. And where that matters actually in the short term is rentals because they typically stay for three years before they purchase something, even though they have the money, they need to land here and establish themselves in their business. And so we're seeing a drastic drop now in the number of the amount of demand. And that's why you've seen in some areas up to $450 price discounts on rentals. That's why that's where that's coming from right. between the Airbnb and the immigration. Yeah, no, that's actually a, an important piece there because I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago as well too, and they're saying they had a condo downtown Toronto where they typically got four thousand dollars for rent, and they've now had to lower it to like below three thousand to actually wow, get that that's place big. filled. So that's, what you're that's saying, that's higher, that's that higher than I, I've seen on average, but certain pockets have gotten hit harder than others. Some of the two bedrooms and three bedrooms, their prices have come down more, but the trade-off is is they're actually renting easier they're finding it easier to find tenants right now because those people are maybe a little more of a stable job. The guys, the trend that's right. happening right now in the rental space is the guys that got knocked off that cushy job and are now looking for an essential work are going to be circling back and going, picking up the bottom and picking up the pieces of the rental market in these one bedroom units. And we've already seen, like if you look just a month or two ago, we've seen up to five, 6% per month price drops. Whereas yep. this month, we've just seen less than 1% price drops. So we've seen a slowing down in the speed that the prices are coming down for rentals for pricing. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. There's a bit of, there's a, bit of a, a bit of a catch that's in place right now. 
Yeah, for sure. And and so for beginning investors that you might be working with, I know you're saying that, you know, you're, it's making maybe a little more sense for them to kind of go on the outskirts. Is there any particular market that you are kind of looking at or that you're advising your investors to go to? So, so from conversations with other people that ask the same question from checking news, checking where there's top city, some of the big pockets that we're seeing, the number one spot I've heard that comes from rain, they say Ottawa. So now that's not in Toronto, but that's in Ontario. So they're saying Ottawa, the reason for that is employment because they haven't been hit by employment. Now, when we look at other lists, they've come further down and the number one list recently published by Money Sense was Guelph, Guelph, Ontario. We've also seen London, Ontario, Kitchener, Waterloo, uh, areas out like Oshawa, Peterborough, which I know you're an advocate for is on that list. So, so whereas Toronto, when you piece, when Money Sense pieced it all together, I think they had 30 to 40 cities, top cities across the country. Toronto was the bottom of the Ontario list, the city of Toronto. And the reason was because really? they, took, they took affordability as the primary decision maker today, because currently our issue is with COVID, people need to be more careful. And because of the careful approach, don't go downtown Toronto. However, on my end, I would say that means that Toronto, there's going to be, and there is a buying opportunity in there. Right. When people are fleeing and people are running yeah. in a market that will, and especially in, in regions that will bounce back quicker, even CMHC admits Toronto will be one of the fastest ones to rebound on the tail end of this. If you can get in there, there's, there's an opportunity for you in there too. But for first time buyers, I would say I would, I would be in line with what they're saying. Go a little further out that you're going to get far more for your money. And, and because you're able to mostly work remotely, there's a great opportunity. Right. Um, listen, I know you love the crystal ball stuff. I want to ask you another crystal ball question. Where do you see Good. interest rates going in the next say year or two? Interest rates could go down. I think they could go down. Really? So last, sorry, what were you going to say? Go on. Go, no, 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 go ahead. Go <laughs> ahead. I'll, I'll ask my next question after. Okay. So you're going to tell me, you're going to ask me about negative interest rates, aren't you? Ah, uh, of course you don't. We're, we're going to go there. We'll, we'll go there. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love this stuff. So Anything economics, I'm, I'm all on it. And, and again, it's outside real estate, but it t- directly applies, right? So I would, when you, if you asked me at the beginning of 2020, I made prediction videos that the interest rates, even before COVID, were going to come down because our economy wasn't doing so hot. Our GDP was already hurting. Right. And, and everyone else was saying it was going to come back up and then it might come back down again a little later. So they were thinking it's going to be kind of like all the mortgage, they were all saying it's going to come up and back down. Yep. What I was saying was, I think it's going to go down, but I don't think it's coming back up. And if we look at the trend of interest rates, and there's no, there's no end in sight of dropping interest rates. In fact, there, we on our podcast talking about an interview, I was laughing about it, where Justin Trudeau, one of the people asked, well, with the cost of the national debt, what do you think is going to be the care? Like, the carrying costs are going to be really high. What do you, how are we going to deal with that? And he laughed at the guy. And he's like, He's like, our interest rates are at record lows. Like he thought it was the most ridiculous question because our interest rates are low. What are you saying our carrying costs are going to be high? And this to me points a picture that there's no plan to bring it back up. In fact, now, however, right. I'm talking in the next couple of years. However, I have seen on a, internationally people saying that Canada is positioned to be the first to bring its interest rates back up on the tail end of this. And the reason for that is because we, we didn't need to sell out all the way down. People bought into the interest rate came down and we caught the market. Our, actually, we have a very strong central bank compared to places like the States. So we, we will be a rebound. We'll be a first to rebound. Now, whether interest rates will go skyrocketing again anytime soon, we can't, we just can't, it's not possible. And so I anticipate you're going to see either flat, which is what they're saying is going to happen, or if anything, it'll come down. Right. I, I agree with that prediction, right? Because, and, and even if we do end up going back up, which I think is going to be years before you really kind of see anything, any kind of a big movement, yeah. um, that's really just so that they can actually have some room to actually do something if the market goes back down again. Because if the market goes back down again, what are they going to do? They're going to lower interest rates to stimulate the market again, right? So they just, they, and, and they're very open with where they want to be. Their, their, their target of, of, of the rates, right? So that they have movement. Yeah, and the Bank of Canada said they're happy with where they are. They're comfortable with where we are. And when we've looked yeah. in the last, the recent past, I'm talking in the last 10 years or so, any attempt yeah. to bring interest rates back up have been immediately followed by another drop. So it's very yeah. difficult when we sit as a, as a country with such a high national and consumer debt level 
to, to raise those rates. And, and I, right. that's why I can't see it happening anytime soon. So if you're looking for a product and you can, if you can make it work, I'd be getting a variable rate mortgage. Right. So with everything that we just talked about today, I'm brand new. I'm listening to this incredible conversation and all the knowledge that you're dropping and, and I'm sitting on the fence on what I should do. What, what do you, what, what, what kind of words of advice are you going to tell me? And I'm ready to invest in real estate, but I'm a little nervous because that's I don't fine. know where things so, might go. That's fine. When I bought my first property, it was 2015, I think 20, something like that. 2014. Yeah. 2014. Yep. That's when I got married. <laughs> that's how I remember it. <laughs> my first property I bought in 2014. Guess yep. what? When I bought, it was a seller's market and it was a filthy gross market. Everyone was saying you should rent. I was a realtor having to make a decision with my wife, a new married couple, whether we should buy or rent as a realtor. That's we decided to purchase. Now, anybody could tell you from that time that, oh, you had it so easy back then. It's so hard. The best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The next best time is today. And so right. assuming you're not getting into this to day trade real estate, which is a terrible idea anyways. I mean, ask anybody that has a REIT right now, whether they're, they're happy they made that purchase. If you're, as long as you're not day trading real estate, you're in it for the long term. you're going to come out in one of the greatest cities in the world. Like if there's a place to invest long-term, if you were to look at everywhere, where would you yep. want to be? I'd want to be in the place where everybody wants to go that was able to weather COVID really well, that has an amazing standard of living is number one in so many categories in the G10, G20. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a great question. Now there, I have a lot of people even follow me that are looking for the downside. The, the joke is, is people who are looking to the market to drop. Those are the ones that are waiting to buy. And the ones who have properties, they want to go up. So everyone has a bias, but generally, if we were to just look at historics, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait it out. Right now, you've got at least a bit of, there's a bit of a, a, a grace period for supply. Is that, it is a unique thing right now where we're not dealing with less than one month of inventory. We're dealing with four months of inventory. So you have a little bit of breathing room. I have some clients who are buying properties conditioned on the sale of a home further out of the city. And right. these are opportunities that even just a few months ago would be impossible. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't count month to month. Love, I love the market. I track it too. But I think if you're looking to get into the market, don't worry so much about timing. You can even track seasonal, right? In the spring, prices are up 5 10%. In the fall, in the winter, there's a discount. So if you're going to buy something, yes, you'll probably see an opportunity later in the year. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't get your panties in a bunch over whether you should wait six months or buy it now. If you want to get into the market, do it what works best for you and your family and for your lifestyle. Yeah, great advice. And you know what's interesting is that anytime I talk to somebody who's successful, the 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 one message that they always have is action. And, and I think that's pretty much what you're what you're letting everybody know is that just to go up there, take action, and don't sit on the sidelines because nothing ever happens there, right? And so I, I appreciate your time, Bradley. Thank you so much for uh, for being on the show. Listen, if you haven't listened to to Bradley's podcast, he is Toronto's number one real estate podcast. Go check him out. Give him a like. And uh, listen, man, all the knowledge this guy has dropped today, you, you got to go and listen to what he's talking about <laughs> in his other shows, man. It's, it's incredible. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your time. Any, Thanks, any last piece of, or even a quote or a book or something that you can kind of leave us with? Oh, man, that I haven't already laid on you yet? I know. I know. You gave uh, us all your gold. Okay. One of the things I would say, I kind of alluded to at the beginning here is don't feel like you can, you can't invest in real estate unless you have a real estate license. I think there's a big, there's a big confusion in our marketplace that people who have a license are there for investing in real estate. People who don't, don't invest in real estate. And that is so far from the truth. Now there are people who have big portfolios that end up getting their license, but the money comes not from selling. The money comes from investing. That's you want money making money because what I'm doing today after this is I'm running to do a home inspection. So unless you want to be running and working and doing podcasts on Canada day, if you don't want that lifestyle, you can still make a fortune as an investor. So I would just say, don't confuse the two, right? If you want to be a salesperson, great. But if you want to invest in real estate, there is, there is no person that's not capable of doing that with the right advice and with the, the action and the motivation. Beautiful. Great way to end off the podcast. Bradley, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. And we'll talk soon. We'll definitely, and once things have to calm down, we'll have to go and grab a drink together. Let's do it. I'm All in. All right. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Take care.